Well, good morning, church. It is good to be up here and beginning our study in First Peter. I am excited uh, to begin this book. Uh, who knows how long it will take us? It only took 10 mon- months to get through Philippians. And so do not hold your breath that we will get any quicker. In fact, as we plan to get through verses 1 through 2 this morning, we will barely make it through verse 1. Uh, because there's just so much richness that Peter is, is putting into this letter that we are going to squeeze every drop we can from God's Word this morning. Now, one of the reasons I am so excited to study First Peter is because of my deep love for stories. If you know me, you love that I love a good story. I love reading all types of stories. Sci-fi, dystopian, utopian, historical fiction, fairy tales, biographies, historical pieces. It doesn't matter. I love a good story. And I love stories so much because I think God created us to be a story people. Across the world and cultures, no matter what differences you have, you will find that people, people love to sit and participate in stories. Our common language is a language of story. I mean, if you want to think about the two most different people in the world in this room that you can think of right now, me and Josh Gamboa, we couldn't be any more different. I grew up in suburban America. He grew up in the inner city. I, I had everything I wanted given to me by crying enough. Josh had to fight for everything he got. I left high school to play baseball, to build my own ego. Josh left and went to the military to build our country. Josh is the kind of guy that beats people up. I am the kind of guy that gets beat up. We are different people. Yet, if you ever entered into a conversation with Josh and I on one of our back porches, you would see how almost every conversation eventually comes to a common love of story. We love talking about a good story. You can hear us argue about the merits of Star Wars, which is garbage, or one of our favorite novelist books, or the difference between the books and the movies and the Lord of the Rings, or whether Washington, George Washington was right in his organization of Hamilton and Jefferson on his cabinet. We love stories. People love stories. We live in stories. We think in stories. And we see ourselves as a part of stories. And when you think of yourselves, it is impossible for you to view yourself without that story. And I think the reason why is because God has created, him, created us to love stories because he has revealed himself in a great story found in Scripture. And I think the reason we love stories is because the Bible is the greatest story in the world. I'm tipping my hand to my method of reading the Bible, but I think that one of the best ways to reading the Bible is to read it as a story. When we say read the Bible in context, we mean that somebody was writing in a very particular context, in a situation. They were a part of something. The text is surrounded by what is happening in redemptive salvation history at the time. It's problematic when we look at the Bible as segmented pieces. It's a rule book here, poetry here, wisdom here, prophecy here. Now, there is all of those types of writing in the scriptures. But remember, all of those are written to aid and help us understand the story of salvation that God is playing out for us. I mean, think about one of my favorite stories. I bring it up over and over again. I'm a nerd. I love Lord of the Rings. And if you've ever read it, you'll see that Tolkien is a master at so many types of literature. Poetry, songs, wisdom, prophecy, rules. And yet it would be a fool to read the Lord of the Rings and miss that what he is doing with all of those types of literature is building into his story, what he's trying to do. Similarly, it would be foolish for us to think that the Bible is all of these separate pieces and not see how all of these pieces are connected for God's story of redemption, that he is saving a people for himself to make his name known in the world. It's a beautiful story. And I bring up that the Bible is this kind of story because Peter, throughout this letter, is explicitly inviting us to participate in the story of redemption. And if we don't understand how Peter is using the story of God's salvation, we cannot understand this letter of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, as much as any New Testament writing, will directly allude to the Old Testament more than almost anywhere else, including Hebrews and Revelation. Peter was of the people of Israel, a Jew to his core. 
The hope of the Jews and the hope of Peter was that one day God would save his people. He would send a redeemer. He would send the Messiah, the Christ, the king to save them. And Peter was one of the Jews who read the Old Testament, Old Testament with the expectation that God would act. So if we want to understand 1 Peter, we need to understand the story of Peter. The story that Peter saw himself as a part of. In the beginning, God created man and woman in a garden perfect without sin. Perfect fellowship with God and with one another. But then the serpent, the devil, rebelled against God and sought to have God's creation rebel against him as well. And he succeeded in getting man and woman to disobey God by eating of the tree they were not to eat from. And from then, sin entered the world and separated mankind from God. But in their punishment, God gives them hope. In Genesis chapter 3, God says to the serpent Satan that one day from the woman would come a seed, an offspring, whom Satan would harm by biting his heel, but ultimately would crush the head of the serpent, would defeat Satan. And from this point on, the story of redemption begins to unfold. Who will this seed be? Who will be this offspring? How will God fix what is broken? Then we see how quickly wicked man gets. And in this wickedness over time, eventually God calls out a single family, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And he makes a promise to Abraham. Through you will come the seed, the offspring. And I will create from you a nation, and I will bless all the families of the earth. And then Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has the twelve sons who become the twelve tribes. And this whole time we're wondering who will be the seed, who will crush the power of Satan, but all of the offspring are failures. But then Jacob has the twelve sons, and Jacob gives a blessing to one of the sons, Judah. And the ruler will come from the line of Judah. And so we've gone from all the families of the earth to now to one family not line. One family within that line. But the anointed one doesn't come. Instead, the twelve tribes go into slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And they multiply under slavery. They become this great nation and are put in bondage to slavery. And then Moses comes and he's a great deliverer to save them. He takes them across the Red Sea. He gives them the law of God, leads them to the promised land. Finally, the deliverer is here. No, we quickly learn that he fails. He cannot keep the law of God, and he cannot take people into the promised land, not to mention that he's not from the line of Judah. And then the people fail over and over again, and eventually they get a king on the throne. And the next time we see the line of Judah really brought up is when a king is put over, a king in the line of Judah, King David. And you read the story, and you understand redemptive history up to this point, and you've got to be thinking, finally, the deliverer has come. He will reverse what was done at the fall. He will be over his people. But we learn very quickly that David is affected by the same curse that everyone else, and he fails. And he cannot save the people, and he leads the people of Israel into evil ways, and he fails. But God makes a promise to David that one day he would set a Christ, an anointed one, on the throne in the line of David, who will establish that throne forever and ever. And so we're still waiting and so David has Solomon, and Solomon has Rehoboam, and we're waiting. But every subsequent king fails. And they fail so much that the kingdom is divided into two nations. You have Israel in the northern kingdom and Judah in the southern kingdom. And the people of Israel, instead of getting more like God, separate. And every single king falls into evil ways, fall into evil, into sex, into greed, into wanting power, and over and over, the curse of Satan again and again. And over and over again, the people say, when will the anointed one come? But they fall so far that the northern king falls first, the people of Israel. And in 722 B.C., Assyria comes and he conquers them. And they go into slavery, into exile. And they, rule, they live under the rule of another king. And this was supposed to be a warning to the southern kingdom, Judah. Hey, if you keep blowing it, Judah, what happened to Israel will happen to you. And they keep blowing it. And so in 586 B.C., Judah falls to the Babylonians. 
who conquers both the north and the south. And the people are groaning in exile. They are hoping, they are crying out, waiting. When will the Messiah come? When will the one from the line of David come? And this whole time, and this is what First and Second Chronicles are all about, keeping track of the line of David. When will the king come? And before and during this time, the prophets are prophesying. And this whole time, their prophecy, the anointed one would come. He's going to rescue them from exile. He's going to lead them out of their punishment from Babylon. He will free them from their trials. He will bring them back to their glory. And the people wait. But then the Babylonians fall to the Persians. And the Persians fall to the Romans. And each rule over God's people. And God's people are still not free. And then over the course of another 400 years of being conquered, the Lord is silent. No more prophets, no more words, exile, bondage, suffering, persecution. And the question is, when will the anointed one come? And it is this last picture of the Messiah, the fact that the Messiah will come to take them out of exile, who will conquer the other nations that we see Peter living his life in. Peter is living during this time of the exile in Rome, awaiting the Messiah, hoping for the king to come. In Rome, under this exile, wondering when will the conquering king come? When will he stop what the Babylonians started and now is under Rome? And then Jesus comes out of the line of David, a son of Abraham, come, Emmanuel, God with us. The Messiah is here, but he isn't the one they thought they would get, and he isn't what they hoped for. Now I'm going to stop here because the reason I told you that story this morning is because our verses this morning hinge upon understanding Peter's transformation and his understanding of who the Christ was. Just how far Peter's thoughts have gone and the story of God has changed as he was a disciple of Christ. Because when Jesus came, he didn't do it the way Peter or anyone else thought he would. And we're going to see in our text this morning just how much Jesus reinterprets God's work, God's work of salvation. And it's essential to understand how Jesus reinterprets God's work because that is the whole purpose of the letter of 1 Peter, to show us how we as the church fit into God's story. And it's not what the Israelites expected. And so the rest of our time this morning, we're going to focus on the three ways that the coming of Jesus reinterprets God's story for Peter that will be fundamental to understanding the rest of this letter. From what he expected to what he got. So three ways the coming of Jesus reinterprets our understanding of the story of God's salvation. First, the coming of Jesus reinterprets what the Christ came to do. What the Christ came to do. Look at verse 1. Peter begins this letter by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here we see that Peter picks up on the story from where I left off. You see, the Christ has come. The key word here is Christ. In our vernacular, we use Jesus and Christ so often together uh, that we think that we miss something important. We think Jesus Christ is his name. Christ is his last name, or it's a good way to curse. But actually, that's not what Christ is supposed to mean. It's an important title. We, would, we should read it as this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus, who is the Christ. That's what he's saying. Peter begins this letter by making sure that they realize that the main character of this story is Jesus, who is the Christ. Christ is the word Messiah, anointed one, chosen one, the central figure of the redemptive story. And Peter will understand the Messiah as fulfilling the Old Testament promises. Fulfilling the story. But this line is so amazing because of who the people of Israel, and especially Peter, thought the Christ was supposed to be. And who he ended up being. I mean, Jesus was not who they expected. Born to a poor family in Bethlehem with no armies at his disposal. The Israelites were awaiting a king to conquer Rome. But they didn't get the king they were, especially, they were expecting, especially Peter. Peter is one of the disciples who got it wrong so very often. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus takes his disciples aside. And he says to the disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some say it's John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, well, Who do you say I am? 
And Simon Peter, our Peter here, replied, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, Peter's got it. He gets it. Jesus is Christ. He is the f- one who's supposed to fulfill it. But does he get it? In the very next verses of Matthew 16, it says this, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And although Peter got it, he doesn't. He is the Christ, but not the Christ that Peter thought of. In fact, Jesus will call Peter Satan, the serpent from the garden, persuading mankind into sin. As Satan has persuaded Peter of a false view of what the Christ came to do, Peter thought the job of the Messiah was to conquer Rome, the new Babylon, to save people from their bondage to this physical nation. He thought Jesus came to rescue the people of Israel. In the gospel, Peter regularly shows that he has no idea what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. He questions how Jesus could feed all these people, how he could walk on water, struggles at the Mount of Transfiguration, tells Jesus he can't wash his feet. And when Jesus is being betrayed, takes a sword and tries to fight for Jesus. Then at the end of the gospel, Peter is so confused about who Jesus is that he doubts him three times and abandons him. Peter knew the Messiah was supposed to come, put his hope in Jesus, and Jesus had let him down because Jesus died on a cross. He wasn't the hoped-for Messiah. The king isn't dying on a cross. The king doesn't suffer. The king reigns. And that is why the opening lines of this epistle are so incredible for us. Because Peter knew the story of the Old Testament, but he didn't understand. Peter had a false narrative, a false story of Christ. He wanted Christ to come and focus on conquering. But this is important because when Peter brings up the story to us, he has a totally transformed, reinterpreted thought from the Gospels. When Peter writes this opening line, it is after Jesus has reinterpreted it. Peter now sees what Jesus was supposed to be as Christ. Peter now sees Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and he knows what it means. That Jesus didn't come first and foremost to fix the Babylonian exile of Judah now under Rome. Jesus didn't come to save a people from a kingdom, but to save a people He came to save a people from their sins. You see, Peter thought that as a person in the nation of Israel, he was already one of God's people. He didn't need anything, but he was totally wrong. He needed to be saved from his sins. And this book, more than most, focuses so heavily on the suffering of the Messiah. Over and over again, Christ's name is brought up through this letter, and it is almost exclusively attached to Christ's suffering. And so we know in 1-1, when he says Jesus the Christ, he means Jesus the one who suffered for us. The suffering of Christ is a main theme throughout this. Peter, who refused to think Jesus could die, now writes more heavily than most anyone else of Jesus' death. Peter now understands that what was needed to be fixed before the people could be free from Babylonian exile was their own sin. And this is why in the very next verse, verse 2, the obedience of Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, Jesus had to go back to the garden to defeat Satan. He is the true Messiah. The real problem in the world is, is not other nations, but our sin. Jesus reinterprets God's story in demonstrating that the Christ came first and foremost to save a people from their sins. Israel didn't need to be saved from Babylon, Persia, or Rome. Israel needed to be saved from themselves. And this is what the Christ came to do, to make a new people for himself. And so when Peter says that he is an apostle of Jesus, who is the Christ, know that he is loading that title with every meaning that Christ has to offer. And we know that from where he's going to go in this letter. 
Jesus came to save a people for himself, dying on the cross. This is what Christ came to do. And so first, Jesus reinterprets what the purpose of God's Christ was. Second, Jesus reinterprets how the Gentiles fit into God's story of salvation. Look at verse 1. To those who are elect exiles, elect exiles. First, we have to deal with the question of who are those? Who are those? Who are those who are elect exiles? Most commentators agree that Peter is writing to a primarily Gentile, which is a non-Jewish audience. We would all be considered Gentiles here. This letter, which heavily focuses on the Old Testament story, written by a Jew who is known for being, in Galatians, an apostle to, the, to Jews, is writing to a primarily non-Jewish audience. He uses language that one would, throughout the letter of one, that is not regularly used of Jewish people, such as ignorant ones in 114. Thus, Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, very Jewish, and even called by Paul in Galatians, this kind of apostle, writes a letter to non-Jewish people, focusing primarily on who's the Christ. Why? As one commentator said, Peter places the church that would have read this letter directly into the story of God's people in the Old Testament. Peter sees the church as the fulfillment, the continuation of the story of God's people that started in in Genesis, that no longer is God's people considered simply an ethnic people, but a called people, those who were saved by the suffering Christ. This would not have made sense to a Jew. The Gentiles were those who were outside the promises of God. In fact, those were the ones who were oppressing the Jews. They were the enemies or those who had to be put up with. They were unclean by nature. And now they have a part with this people. The Gentiles are brought into the story. And notice how he brings them into the story. He calls them elect exiles. Both give us what we need to understand how Peter is fitting the church into this narrative. The word elect is a very specific term given to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not going to rehash the whole story and go through it all again, but we could. However, I will turn to one verse in particular that points to what Peter is doing. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 37, Moses is charging the people to follow and love the Lord. And he says this, You are to love the Lord because the Lord... God loved your fathers and elected them and elected their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power. Usually when the word elected comes up, it is in reference to just how weak and pathetic the people were to save themselves. It is almost exclusively used of God and his work in choosing to save Israel out of Egypt. And if you think of what the word elect means, it means this. Elect can mean save as the people of God. God comes in and creates you. You didn't do anything to become the people of God. You were weak and pathetic, Israel, but God came and made you a people, although you had nothing to offer him. That's what it means over and over again. He foreknew you, that's where the verse is going next in verse 2, and chose to love you anyway. It is the love that takes a band of sinners and turns them into a people, from slavery into a nation, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, which, again, is where Peter is going in chapter 2. Now, Peter uses the imagery of the elect people out of Egypt, chosen by God, and who is he applying this word elect to? Saved from bondage. Anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ not just the Jews. He's writing to Gentiles. Anyone whom the Lord saves. Do you see how Jesus reinterprets the story? He came to call an elect people. He is the Christ to those who are elect. This is what Christ came to do. He came to choose. He came to call. He came to create a people out of bondage of slavery of sin. But I want you to focus in. Look, it's not just that we're elect. Look at what he does. He attaches the word elect to exiles. The word exiles is the word primarily used of Israel when they have been conquered by other nations. In our scripture reading, reading Jeremiah, when God talks about their exile to the Babylonians, 
Remember, the Babylonians came in and conquered Judah. And this is the very specific word used of Israel while they are in the Babylonian exile. And we know that Peter is alluding to that Jeremiah passage because, turn over in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. Just look at chapter 5, verse 13. Look at what Peter will say here. He starts the letter with talking about those who are in exile. And then look how he finishes the letter. She who is at Babylon who is likewise chosen, word elect again, who is likewise elect, chosen, sends you greetings. You see what Peter is doing here? We see these ideas being put together that those in Babylon, like the church, Gentiles, not ethnic Israel, the church is in exile. It is the chosen people, chosen by God, for what? To be in exile. Chosen by In exile. You see what Peter is doing here? Yes, the Gentiles are elect, but they are not just chosen for salvation, they are actually chosen for exile. They were chosen to stay in exile for a little while longer. Jesus wasn't surprised when he came and didn't free Israel from their bondage to Rome. That's because he had another purpose and mission. And this P- Peter will focus so heavily. It's actually the epistle of hope. And it's, it's, it's known as being a type of apocalyptic or in time letter. Why? Because we are in the waiting period as we await the Christ to come back again. See, the Israelites misunderstood the prophecies. They thought that when Jesus came the first time, it was to rescue them from bondage to Babylon. But what they needed was to actually be made a people. God needed to create a people for himself, saved from their sins. And now we wait for the fulfilling of the final promises of the prophecies that Jesus will come again to those who are in exile in Babylon. That's what we're waiting for. And notice this. That means Jesus didn't make a mistake when he left us in exile. It was purposeful. He has purposely left us. He has chosen us for exile. We wait the second coming as we await the Babylonian captivity. And what Peter does is he reinterprets the Old Testament, Israel in captivity, and in the coming of Jesus, sees now as the church, as the continuation of that story. The church is the one in exile. Israel thought the exile was about them and God's promises to them. But Peter sees it as God's promises to the church, that God promises to free the church from exile. The Jewish prophecies promised this. However, Jesus, when he did this true exile, he's now, or this, this true freeing of our bondage, now we await for the exile in Babylon. And this actually points to the main purpose of the whole letter, the question of the letter. How do those who have been chosen by God rightly live in exile in the world? And now we see that Peter has reinterpreted, Jesus has reinterpreted the story of salvation as he has brought Gentiles into the fold. He has made the church his elect as exiles. Peter is writing to the church and saying this to us. Elect exiles, we'll we'll see, is the main theme of this whole letter. But for now, what I want you to realize is what God has done. Who, what has Jesus done? He reinterprets the story of God's salvation by bringing Gentiles in as elect exiles. Last, the coming of Jesus reinterprets our suffering. Look again at verse 1. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Here, like above, Peter uses a loaded Old Testament word, dispersion. I'm not going to go through all the references here, but it harkens back again to the Babylonian exile when the Israelites were dispersed among the other nations, separated or dominated. To be dispersed is the word used of suffering in the Old Testament. When they are dispersed, it is directly linked to the suffering under another nation, to be under the dominion of another, another kingdom. And this, he says, the church is dispersed under the dominion of another kingdom. He is talking very specifically about suffering, which, again, we are going to get to just in a minute in chapter 1, in the next couple weeks, depending on how long it takes us. In the next couple weeks, suffering. 
But it's important for us to understand the context of 1 Peter, to understand the type of suffering that Peter is talking about when writing. We know that this letter was probably written in the early to mid-60s A.D. And the area that Peter writes, this area is modern-day Turkey. And it doesn't actually seem like, based on the historical evidence and what we see even here, that this type of persecution was government, uh, was government-endorsed persecution. The first major government persecution that we know of in this area happens specifically with Pliny and Trajan in the second century, so much later on. Uh, so Christians were persecuted, but not at the wide scale that we think of, where just every time a Christian turned a corner, they were getting killed. That wasn't happening at this time. The type of persecution that Peter is talking about is poor, probably very much more like being a social outcast. There's one commentator who's done a lot of work on this that talks about how because the, the, the churches refused to uh, cave to the social norms of society. They didn't worship the same gods anymore. They didn't participate in emperor worship anymore. And because they refused to participate in what was happening socially, they weren't allowed to buy as many goods. People wouldn't come to their shops to buy things. They were outcasts. They were kicked out of the community center. Like everything communally that they would have participated in, they were now barred from. It's not as though they were getting killed all the time, but this is a very serious persecution. It's more than just people were killed from their faith. The way Christians were understood as being those who subverted the common good. And because of that, they were looked at with disdain. They were outcasts. They're second-class citizens, lower citizens, picked on, fought against. And this is where you're going to see the words honor and shame appear regularly in 1 Peter. That you are shamed now, but God has honor for you. And in chapter 2, honor is for two, seven. Honor is for you who believe, but those who do not believe, shame. Right? So the whole idea of persecution here is probably more in line with you are being shamed and shunned by your society, but don't worry, honor is on its way. You are honored by God. And this is actually probably much more like the Israel exile under Babylon. Most of the time, yes, there were big pockets where they were killed and persecuted every day. But most of the time, the Israelites weren't killed every day. I mean, even in the Jeremiah passage, God is telling them to be alive and to live in society and to grow in society. But the Israelites were seen as second-class citizens. They fought against the worship of kings. They were a bit annoying. They were ashamed to the culture. They couldn't rise very far in society. They suffered under the load of another nation and are not able to flourish as God's people. And what we see here is that Peter reinterprets the story for the church. Because when Israel was taken into exile, and this is where like, what Peter is doing here I think is amazing, because he uses this word focused on the Babylonian exile being under another, facing this kind of suffering. However, The reason that the Israelites were under that suffering is because they blew it. They were in sin. They disobeyed God. That's why they were dispersed. However, that is not the picture that we see happening to the church. We see here that Christ has come. And in the coming of Christ, our sins have been paid for. We are not dispersed among the nations because we are sinning and he has to punish us. We are dispersed among the nations because we are elect exiles. We are dispersed because our sins are forgiven, not to forgive our sins. The way Peter understands our suffering is not that our sin like Israel pushes us out, but because we are elect exiles and being dispersed is God's mercy on us. It is growing and shaping us more into Christ's likeness. And further, as we will see in chapter 3, that we are able now to give a defense for the hope that is in us. Our dispersion is actually God's mercy on the world that others may know Him. That is what it means for us to be elect exiles, a temple, a holy nation, dispersed into the world. We are actually fulfilling the Great Commission by being dispersed into the world. That this is God's plan for His people the whole time. Suffering is God's plan the whole time. And so Peter reinterprets our suffering. It is for our good and the good of the world to know Jesus, who is the Christ, as the suffering Lord. 
Church, I am excited to embark on our journey of this letter, a letter for exiles, a letter for us, those whom Jesus has come to save from our sins, who has elected us for exile, and who transforms our suffering for the good of us and the advancement of the gospel. This book, more than anything, is showing us who are we? What is our identity in this world? And I don't know about you, but that is a question that I struggle with almost daily. How, as a Christian, as the church, do we live in this world? This is what Peter wrote for. And we have only hit the tip of the iceberg today. Now, in light of what we've talked about, though, I want to end by bringing up maybe, I think, a few ways that we are in danger, like Peter, before the resurrection of the Christ. Some ways that I think that maybe we, in our own cultural context today, wrongly understand the, go- the, the story of God's salvation. And I think it boils down to this. When we come to Jesus, do we expect the wrong things? What did you expect when you came to Jesus? What did you expect living in this world would be like? What did you expect being an elect exile would be? And based on what we've studied, let me just give you a few things that I think we wrongly expect out of Jesus. First, I think we wrongly expect Jesus to fit our agenda. Like Peter, I think we are in danger of trying to mold Jesus into the Messiah we want him to be. Not a suffering Christ, but a Christ who dominates for us, who conquers for us. I think we see this mindset, especially in the way we talk about Jesus to non-believers. Jesus can take all your problems away. Come to Jesus. And he'll fix you. He'll make you better. Jesus can make you happy. Jesus is this self-help guru, and you are at the center of the story and not Jesus. Jesus can grant you health and wealth. Now, I don't want to be too harsh here because Jesus can and does do a lot of great things for us. Jesus can and does, I think, make us happier. At least he should. Yet how many people, especially young teenagers, leave the faith every year? We have a major problem. It's called deconstructionism, when people try to deconstruct the Christian faith. How many people, especially young people, leave the faith every year? A lot. And I wonder if it's because we have wrongly expected Jesus to fit our narrative. We've defined what the word Christ means wrongly. And when we define that wrongly and Jesus doesn't meet those expectations, we abandon him. What did you think Jesus came to do? Jesus came not to give you some mystical power, not to save you from other people around you, but to save you from yourself. You are the enemy, not them. You are the problem. Your sin is the problem. And Jesus came to make enemies sons and daughters, a people for himself. That is what it means that he is the Christ. He came to free us from the bonds of Satan. And like Israel... Israel didn't, their biggest problem wasn't the nation. The problem was them, that we can't keep the law of God on our own. We don't have what it takes, that we are our biggest enemies. We are what is wrong with the world. I have heard people over and over again say this about the church. I wouldn't go, I would go to church, but the church is full of hypocrites. It sure is. It sure is. And if you join the church, you would make it so much worse because you're a hypocrite too. But that's who Jesus came to save. Hypocrites who know they're hypocrites and repent over and over and over again. This is what Jesus came to do. He came to make a people for himself. And I think that so many people are leaving the church because we wrongly have, we've given them wrong expectations of what Jesus came to do. Secondly, I think we wrongly expect Jesus to create a home for us here. I think that we wrongly expect in the story of salvation that Jesus came to create a home for us here and now. I think this is especially difficult us for us in our current culture where we live in an overall peaceful setting. I think that when Jesus, when we, when we come to Jesus, so often, whether we say it or not, we, we want Jesus to make us feel more comfortable in the world. And maybe you know this isn't true, but our reactions in the world prove otherwise. We get so frustrated and annoyed when things in our country don't go the way we want it to. We don't understand when people don't listen to us. 
We can't believe that people don't see our rationalization for this law or this law or how we could make a better nation if we just did this. I mean, not only that, but look at how hard we work to be seen as the same of everyone else. I mean, we make our life's duty as Christians to show the world that Christians aren't lame, that we can be awesome and cool too, that we can do everything the culture does. No, 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 no. We expect that when we became Christians that we can make everything, we, we, can, we can do our work to make this world our home. Did you expect that when you came to Jesus, that he might make you feel more comfortable in the world? Did you expect that this would be your home? But here we see how Jesus reinterprets the story for us. This is written to elect exiles. We were chosen to not belong in this world. We were chosen purposely not to fit in. Not fitting in, actually, as we will see in chapter 3, is our testimony, is our witness of God's goodness. When we act differently, and this is where the letter's going to go in chapter 2, as we subject ourselves differently for the Lord's sake to every human institution, as we subject ourselves differently to human institutions like our bosses, as wives subject themselves differently to husbands, and husbands differently love their wives, as parents love their children differently, and children love their uh, parents differently, what will be seen is you don't fit in. You're different. Be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you. That's where the whole letter's going. This isn't our home. We are exiles. We don't belong here. And so when they don't listen to you, what did you expect? You're different. If it feels like you are a foreigner and don't belong in this world, it's because you don't. God is preparing an inheritance that is being kept for you in heaven. And he will create a new heavens and a new earth. And that will be our home. Third, we wrongly expect... Jesus to take away our suffering. Again, the type of suffering in 1 Peter is a social pressure and shame. And I think when we became Christians, we wrongly expected that now we would fit in somewhere. Again, I think this is so true of young people. There is no greater desire for us than I think to know that we belong. We want to know that others respect us, care about us, think, about, think well about us. I mean, social media predicates itself on this idea. We want to belong. We want to know that others care about us. And I can't tell you in my own life that this has become one of the greatest anxieties. I want to know what other people are saying about me, and I want them to think well about me. And we all struggle with this. As adults, I think we struggle with this. We, we don't, who likes not belonging? Who likes feeling like they are dispersed? We want, we want to be respected. We don't want to be homeless. Who likes knowing that they are seen as a second-class citizen? Who likes being shamed? Who likes suffering? But this is exactly what Jesus promises. He promised that to follow him would cost you everything. But here is the hope, and this is where I don't want to leave you with this, because I want to leave you, Peter is the epistle of hope. We will see that this shaming, this dispersion, is actually the best thing that could have happened to us. Because our dispersion means that God is keeping an inheritance for us, that he has honored you and chose you from all the peoples of the earth. And so what did you have, what did you expect of God's plan of salvation? What did you expect Jesus would be like? What did you think the Christ was supposed to do? I pray that this morning that your story has been reinterpreted by Jesus. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. I pray that you would help us to understand and see the richness and the goodness that is found in this epistle. There is so much goodness here. There is so much for us to grasp on, for us to chew on, to meditate on. Father, I pray for the church this morning that you would help us understand our role as elect exiles in this world. And Father, see it as a privilege knowing that you are the Christ who has chosen us to be a people scattered 
throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray.